Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to another edition of Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. I'm Thos Ribbits, and following on from something I said a couple of weeks ago, I've been musing on what might have happened if Sting had been asked to create My Fair Lady. I suspect we'd have had Henry Higgins sing a song where he says, Yes, I'm Pygmalion, a legal Pygmalion. I'm an Englishman who's into talk. Right, stepping firmly away from that travesty, let's get into the business of the day. And it's another round-up episode of some of the musicals that you could have seen at this year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe. As I've said before, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe in 2022 was a magnificent return to form. And it had such a wonderful atmosphere, people were so pleased to be back, whether they were performers or punters turning up to see shows. And amongst their number were me and Mike Shapiro. And it's me and Mike that you're going to be hearing in today's conversation because we're going to be talking about four different shows in some depth that we saw and liked from this year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe. And they are Medea the Musical, Lizard Boy, and there's a contrast in concepts, followed by a show called Dots and Dashes. And finally, a show I'm going to call for the time being The Handbook of Civilian Defence, although its actual title, as you'll hear in our conversation, is considerably longer. And in the course of discussing those four shows, we'll also be picking up on two other shows that you could have seen at this year's or previous Edinburgh Festival Fringes, including Vote Macbeth, which we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, and Adam and Eve and Steve, which was a musical that you could have seen at the Fringe a few years ago. It's always a joy to sit down with Mike to hear about the shows that he has seen and when it's an opportunity to talk about some shows that we saw together, as indeed was the case for this week's episode, it's even more pleasurable. Now Mike brings magnificent insights into the shows he sees from his vantage point of being a composer and lyricist in his own right and of course he's written and produced a number of magnificent shows which have been hugely successful in their own right and I'm thinking here just to name two, The Bully Problem and Gideon and the Blundersnorp. And you could have seen those at the Hollywood Fringe. So an additional extra flavour that Mike brings to this show is that he knows about other fringes for musical theatre. But let's get down to the business of the day, and that's this year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe as we talk about these four wonderful shows, Medea, Lizard Boy, Dots and Dashes, and the Handbook of Civilian Defence. I hope you enjoy this episode. Musical Talk Mike, you and I are here again recording at the Royal Festival Hall on one of our favourite subjects, which was this year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe 2022. We've had a chat about it before, but there's plenty of meat left on the bone, I think. Plenty of things to talk about. Absolutely, and I want to repeat that. It's so good to be back in Edinburgh for a full real-life IRL fringe. We (laughs) talked about uh, some of the online offerings in past years, and those were very valuable stop gaps, but there's nothing like the real thing. There is nothing like the real thing. That is absolutely right. And there were some marvellous things to see. You know, it's it's true that the great thing about Edinburgh is there are so many different shows, but you only pay small prices for good theatrical experiences. You know, it's still an average of £10 or so for a, an hour of musical theatre. You're not going to find a deal like that anywhere else. And if you see some shows which don't match your taste or which are merely average or brilliant you've only lost £10 or you've made a massive investment on your £10. We're going to be talking about the shows that we liked or we thought had really interesting things going on. One of the ones we're going to start with today is actually another show that we really thought was a top-notch show right up there at the sort of our Premier League of best shows for the year and that's Medea the musical. Now that's the classical Medea not Medea as in have some Madeira Medea. Right. Um, which is, would be a Flanders and Swan biopic musical, which actually I'd be up for seeing. But Medea, if anyone knows anything about Medea, is a piece of classical Greek literature, which is a tragedy. 
it's essentially about a woman who's well the deer who is estranged from the famous Jason Jason of the Argonauts this is another chapter of his life but he's not the central character here he has left Medea his wife uh, for another woman and Medea gets increasingly upset about this quite understandably and as she finds she's got no agency in this relationship in any way that she is very much the, uh, the former wife and not part of his life in any way she ultimately in the original murders their joint children and it is a great tragedy and I saw it on stage in London a few years ago with the late Dame Diana Rigg it was a magnificent performance as you might expect but seeing it was a full and harrowing experience I would say seeing Medea the musical touched on different tonal points in the emotional journey of Medea but also us as the audience so we liked it a lot and, and you've had a chance to interview the writer and star I did. I've spoken to Haley Canham at length, so um, I'll, I'll just give my opinion in brief here because you can listen to that subsequent episode and hear all the gory details, uh, <laughs> literally and figuratively. This was one of the two shows that I thought really stood out and that I imagined having a future. So much so that I said, I've got to grab the, the creator and talk to her before she's famous. Although she's actually already famous because she was a, a star of the original production of Matilda uh, as a performer. So I, I got her between periods of fame. <laughs> but she's um, building up her way in the world of musical theater. As a writer and performer. So, yeah, it was a, it was a really moving show. Now, when you think of Medea in terms mm. of the character arc, I mean, ultimately the story of Medea is taking a postscript to the larger legend of Jason and the Argonauts, almost a plot complication. Yes. You know, Jason has a, a, has a tragic flaw, as do the classical heroes in Greek mythology they tend to do, and he pays the price for that later. But Medea as a character originally was just meant to be his comeuppance for arrogance and hubris, right? She wasn't meant to be a character that was fully fleshed out with her own emotional journey, and Euripides' play looked at this tiny part it was very much kind of the Guildenstern and Rosencrantz are dead of its era, where he looked oh. at, at a supplementary character and turned the spotlight on her and said, what's her emotional experience? And what Haley did with this show, she took a character who is portrayed as a, a vessel of rage, perhaps righteous rage, mm. and vengeance, and explores the feelings of helplessness and rage and vengeance. And she turned it into something much more nuanced and sympathetic. The emphasis of this show, well, first of all, here's a, here's a big picture description, and we'll go into this more in detail in the interview, but it is like Vote Macbeth moved to modern day. Medea's breakup with Jason is portrayed as a contemporary divorce, complete with divorced lawyer. Yes. And all of the characters from Euripides, or I should say some of the characters from Euripides' original are transformed into modern equivalents. And we look at the emotional experience of the divorce. The angle of the show is showing Medea as someone who is very vulnerable, very, I don't want to say needy because that implies a kind of psychological defect, but someone who very much wants Jason for good or for ill and is feeling gutted from this betrayal, this divorce, uh, losing Jason to somebody else, and goes through a series of efforts to try to repair that relationship or reconstitute it with increasing desperation and direness. And this is very different from a story of, of a woman scorned who then turns to despicable ends. The music is fantastic, it's contemporary, it's witty, it's touching, and for me this was a highlight of the Fringe as a whole. What, what were your impressions? Oh, it's definitely one of the highlights. I mean, uh, I, I would identify this as one of the three best musicals that I saw in Edinburgh this year. The other two being Vote Macbeth, which, funnily enough, I think is almost like a stablemate, funnily enough, Medea, and The Pick of the Fringe, which for me was uh, Kathy and Stella solve a murder, which is a very different kind of musical. But for me, Medea and Macbeth have some similarities. I don't mean that in any other way that they feel to me like they're very successful, brand new musicals about classical stories involving, you know, murder, brutality. They give us a clever contemporary twist on each of them and they each end up with a judgment. Now, in the case of Medea, it's set in a court, exactly as you say, uh, and we have this um, lawyer character, solicitor character, all the way through, who's also a kind of narrator character, and he speaks to us, he breaks the fourth wall, he talks directly to us on a number of occasions. He's also a bit of a mover and shaker in the story, for good or for ill. There's a sense that actually he's not the lawyer in Medea's story, she is very much the... Um, 
in his world, she's very much a character in his story. I suspect he thinks that this musical is about him rather than about her. And the reason to me that Medea feels to be like a, a, a stablemate of Macbeth, not just because of the uh, the fact that the you know it's a central character of a classical text. There's death. There's brutality. There's machinations. And there are, you know, there's a parallel between Lady Macbeth, of course, is a famous manipulating character. The lawyer in Medea is a manipulative character. Also, he, he, I think, from the point of view of, if you were making a judgment as to whether he was an ethical solicitor, I think you would have to argue that he was a non-ethical solicitor. He certainly seems to be prepared to manipulate Medea. And she's not an easy woman to manipulate. You know, she's a very strong woman in many senses into particular decisions and paths. And then they both come to an ending, which are both very, very different, but leave you thinking at the, at the end in a way I don't want to reveal. But I thought the two shows, if they had come from the same author, even, I might have not been surprised. There's a sense that, to me, they, 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 they are very different, and yet I can see parallels. I'm going to speak in deliberately antiquated language here. You are talking my uh, language. Antiquated is where yes, I'm at. Perfect. But I hope the spirit of this is I interpret this kind of as a as a Lucy hand waving metaphor rather than something meant in a very literal sense. Vote Macbeth felt like a very masculine storytelling experience, and Medea the musical felt like more of a feminine one. And maybe it's just because I'm thinking of the author in both shows. Uh, or the main character in both shows. But Macbeth was more militant. You know, it was much more, you know, grasping the reins of fate at every turn. And um, Medea was, the character had agency, uh, but it was much more emotionally introspective. Um, it was much more about revealing the, the journey of somebody who had had a, a terrible event happen to them and how they were dealing with that. So emotionally and tonally different, but actually touching on some of the same issues, but from those different vantage points. Exactly right. So I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought that they were written by the same author, but the parallels you're drawing between them are very interesting and apt. As a postscript, I've, I've used the terms masculine and feminine as a kind of clumsy shorthand. Uh, it's not meant to be definitive. It's certainly not meant to offend anyone. Yeah, no, it just helps understanding, I think. Exactly. I will also make one other slight, and this one's a little bit more of a out there kind of parallel, but there was a show here in Edinburgh a few years ago, which I believe is a fairly well-established show called Adam and Eve and Steve, giving a gay twist on the creation story. Um, but actually, the reason I draw a parallel with that is, is twofold. First of all, one of, um, there's a song in uh, Adam and Eve and Steve, which I think is actually the best song from that particular musical, which is called It's All About Me which is the devil comes on at the beginning and he's very charismatic. Uh, and he uh, basically sings a song about how the, how the story of the Garden of Eden is really his story. Adam and Eve are just bit parts in his story. And you can see immediately why I think there might be a parallel with the, um, the non-ethical solicitor here. Uh, he has his ability to break the fourth wall uh, and he sings his song. Which is, it's not the same song at all, but there is this sense of actually you're in my story and I'm, going, you know, I'm telling you the story of Medea and the fact that actually it isn't that at all is, uh, is, is, is an amusing element for us uh, and shows up his arrogance and actually, oddly, his, you know, it really characterises who that, that solicitor is in the way that the song in uh, Adam and Eve and Steve also did. Adam and Eve and Steve at one level is also, uh, you know, it's uh, about relationships changing from one to another you know it's a breakup story i suppose you could call it right. and medea certainly a breakup story um several <laughs> yeah and uh, i also like this idea that you've got the you've got a manipulative character you've got a story which is telling itself anyway and then there's a manipulative character either the devil or the solicitor who's also adding his two penneth mostly for the non-benefit of the characters in the piece i would argue so i'm, I'm, I'm not drawing any big parallel but I do like this, you know, they're all classical stories. You know, I'm not going to get into the discussion as to uh, theological truth or otherwise of these issues. But all three stories are from classical literature in different forms. You know, it's interesting. We're, talk we're in a world here where Mac Macbeth is the modern story of the three we're talking about. But they're established texts, they're established stories. And there are some interesting parallels all, all across the board there. I think in terms of Medea, I'm really looking forward to hearing your interview because I think that's going to... Uh, tell me a lot about this show which I simply adored. It was a, it was a real highlight uh, of the Fringe experience for me this year so um, I, I was really happy to have had a chance to talk to the creator.
But there were other interesting shows, uh, and it's probably time we address one that isn't based on a classical text uh, in this episode, and that's Lizard Boy, which is a new, already very successful cult musical in America, which has finally made it over here in Britain. Uh, at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, with rather interestingly two different casts. It had because it's a three-hander, uh, two chaps and a woman, and there's the American cast, which includes uh, Justin Hurtus. I'm not sure I've pronounced his name correctly, but he's the writer, mm-hmm. and he plays the central character, the Lizard Boy of the title. But there's also a British cast, and we saw the British cast, who were playing the same characters on different days, and. I think we were rather taken by it, wasn't it? I mean, it's, it's, what I like about it is, if I may say, it's, it's a kind. It feels like it's a cult. It is already a cult, but it's a modest cult. I, I really liked it for its, for its modesty and its um, and modesty in, its, in the broader sense. It's not look at us, we're being quirky. It's actually a very sincere, very humane story about someone who has a traumatic event in their childhood where they basically meet a dragon, and as a result of the interaction with this dragon, who is killed, and whose motivations are later discussed, we get a character who's really had to hide for pretty much all of his life because essentially he's become the lizard boy because um, being covered in dragon blood has given him lizard skin. I mean we take some of these things as uh, probably not scientifically accurate (laughs) but within this world this is a character who's terribly lonely and of course actually there's the added value here that he's a gay character and I'm not suggesting in 21st century western civilization that uh, being gay makes you lonely but you know there's a smaller pool from which to fish you know it's harder to be gay in the sense there's only one in ten people are gay whereas nine in ten who are straight so just statistically it's difficult so you already have a character who's essentially outside of society who's a hermit who's dating online because it's the only way he can do it and can only really sort of go out into the community when there are sort of essentially science fiction fan cons going on or Halloween so his skin doesn't make him look like anything other than a cosplayer I like these concepts and these conceits and then the story unravels itself very nicely to its conclusion where actually the big bad we're encouraged to look at again I think in a number of different ways for me that that was this is this is the unique selling point of Lizard Boy for me but actually that there's there's a lot of sorrow there's a lot of sadness there's a lot of sincere sadness in it and through that sadness and the outsider nature of the central character we are also asked to look at the outsider nature of the speech marks the bad guys, the villains. The enemy, exactly right. This show reminds me a little bit of Bat Boy. Yes. Not just because they both have titles that are structured as animal name boy, but that they used a physical difference in the main character as a metaphor for being an outsider. Yeah. I think Bat Boy was meant to be more of a allegory for the experience of being gay during a time when that was less socially welcomed. And he does wear a bow tie, and if that's not a clue... It absolutely is. I, I, don't, I don't want to speak for the intentions of the author, but that's how Bat Boy came across to me. It's certainly an interpretation, definitely. Yep. In this case, the character is explicitly gay, but that's not presented as a reason for being lonely. So I think that was incidental or uh, just the, the, the frame of reference for the author. But he does, as you say, have lizard skin, which was a side effect of being drenched by lizard blood during a, da- a dragon attack. So uh, th- that's, that's the setup, and it's very much drawn from comic book culture, uh, and very cleverly so. It's, it's very sharp. It's very yes. witty. The lyrics are very clever. They're down to earth, but they always feel like they have greater meaning than they are evidently presenting. There's some micro and macro parallels going on, aren't there? I agree. The, the music is very, uh, I would call it kind of acoustic folk pop, uh, very contemporary, but because the instrumentation of various types of acoustic instrumentation, it has a organic quality. So if you want to compare it to the hyper-produced sound of Vote Macbeth, which we described in, in another episode, this felt more intimate, more like a chamber music, both in terms of the size of the cast, but also the instrumentation. There was a uh, fluid back and forth between musicians and performers, because you just have three people, and they are responsible yes. for all the musicianship duties. And it was very skillfully handled. There was a moment where Lizard Boy is feeling literal pangs of, of, I guess, physical pangs as a transformation is underway, and he kind of will stop periodically and go, ow! Yeah. And the way this was handled musically is that another actor, I think typically the, uh, the woman who plays the siren character, uh, we'll just hit a discordant cluster on the piano. Yeah. And we accept this language. We see the characters going back and forth between musicians. Sometimes they will hand each other guitars or violins or other or instruments. Cello. 
That's right. There was a cello. Uh, and it's done. That's It's part of the language of the show. It does not feel unnatural. We just accept that yeah. that's what's going on. And it's very clever because it allows them to pick up a diversity of different instruments. Uh, there's some um, there's shakers. There's hand percussions. There is... Uh, I want to say accordion, but I don't think that's right. But there, there are definitely some kind of folksy instruments thrown in along with the more traditional pop instrumentation. And it gives the show a lot of, of color, musical color. And uh, it's very admirable for that reason. Well, funnily enough, I agree with you entirely. And actually, the, the array of instruments was surprising. You know, it is, you'd, I don't often see guitars and cellos in the same piece. And actually, that gives you an interesting musical sound and soundscape, but also is interesting visually. Um, I think we both noticed that the cello had um, sort of markers on the, the, I'm going to call it the fretboard. Um, if there were frets, it would be the fretboard. But the neck of the instrument has right. a few uh, markers that I think uh, speak to the difficulty of playing cello when you're not a specialist and when you are constantly moving back and forth between yeah. different instruments and you're and holding characters. the cello and putting yeah. it aside. Um, I think it, it was very practically, well, the, the musicianship was very practically plotted. And this is what I mean by modest at one level. You've got three people doing so much with what I'm going to say so little. And I don't mean that in terms of a narrative. I'm talking about, you know, it's a, an Edinburgh stage. It is a platform. There is, um, I noticed there was, a, I think there was a piano with a keyboard stash into it. So there was certainly, um, you know, there are instruments on stage or leaning against the platform. But, 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 but the sincerity of the piece and the story is micro. But it is telling this story, which is already sort of mythological in the world we're living in. You know, it is this, this, the, the arrival of the first dragon, you know, a mythical creature in real life, which took place when, this, when our central character was a young boy. So we're talking 15, 20 years ago. And it's still spoken about. And there was this kind of sort of celebratory, as you say, Mardi Gras kind of event for it. Um, actually, world building. You know, this is not the world we live in. But it's only a twist away from the world we live in. And I thought it portrayed that very well. It was oddly believable for something so unbelievable, if that makes sense. And I suppose that, must can, only, that can only come from a kind of emotional truth of the characters. I also think that the story was very well thought out. I don't remember if it's a comic book adaptation or an, uh, or an original work, but it was... When you have a story that has so much... I'll say metaphysics. There's so much yeah. sort of mythology that's necessary to understand in order to make sense of the story. And we don't know any of it going in. The story has to introduce the fact that there yeah. was a dragon invasion and it has to give some exposition. The, the story was very um, skillful in delivering that musically in a way that allowed us to understand what was going on and not feeling like we were taking a lecture break or you know, an exposition break. It, it all flowed very nicely. Another thing I liked was the parallels in the characters that they have ostensibly who they are is drawn very quickly and then we very quickly or over the course of the story get to see that those characters are doing very very different things uh, for example the um, I think he was was his name Brian or Eric I can't remember but the um, basically lizard boy hooks up with somebody goes round to his flat and this chap is all over him very quickly thinking he's wearing a cosplay a cool cosplay skin um, you know, this chap's already just wearing his underpants, he's taking his trousers off, so, you know, a sexual encounter looks like it's very much on the, on the cards. And so, you know, you immediately peg this chap as sort of a slightly sexually voracious uh, online data, and by data I mean for sex, you know, there's not much small talk, they, it looks like he's up for it immediately. And yet it turns out that he's a really gentle character all the way through, that actually what he is looking for is a bond of connection with a human, and the sex is just a kind of, sort of an entree, if you like, uh, and presumably hasn't been terribly successful in the past. The same with the um, angel character. She's a, she's a singer. Uh, she's quite spiky. Um, and then you realise that she's got hidden secrets as well. And that, in fact, actually, she, she goes on a path which I wasn't expecting, um, rather a splendid one, actually, that, uh, you know, she has a warped logic, which I will not be uh, clarifying, but she has a warped logic about what she's doing, which makes absolutely sense at one kind of warped logical way. But for those of us who are not using warped logic, you can see the flaws of. Uh, I love her misguidedness, if you like, and her sincere misguidedness, which were making her do terrible things. It follows the maxim of everyone being the hero in their own story. 
and I think in her case, what she's doing, she, she's taking the steps yeah. she thinks necessary in order to save humanity, but that we would regard as uh, extreme and, and, and evil in their own right, perhaps, in some sense. There's some healthy debate. Yeah. If, it, it's hard to put yourself in the mindset of somebody who does live in a world that is under, you know, uh, extra normal forces. Yes which is never true here. Like if, if somebody in real life said, well, I'm doing the following things to prepare for the arrival of the UFO invasion, we'd say, well, that's not a thing. What, what yeah. are you doing? But in this world, the, the invasion is a real thing. And it, yes. So we have to judge them in context, I think. But overall, we thought Lizard Boy was a truly successful piece. And I also want to add that I, I had listened previously to the cast album recording. And to fill in my understanding of what was happening, I read the Wikipedia plot synopsis. Now, Wikipedia is like the, uh, the river in Heracliton philosophy, always changing. But as of this recording, the Wikipedia summary has a different version of the story. And in particular, the ending is very different. So uh, if you're doing what I did and you feel a little put off by what seems to be the ending, I want to say that the show... As we said earlier, there's no, no substitute for the real thing. Yes. And in this case, you will not get a real experience of the show from the cast album and the, as of today, Wikipedia synopsis. And in particular, the ending of the version we saw was superior and much more emotionally resonant than what I read in Wikipedia. So don't feel put off by the story if, if the written in Wikipedia ending is not to your liking. Give the show a chance. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised, as I was. Now, the thing about Lizard Boy is, of course, there's lots of... Because we say it's this world that's slightly one degree tilted from where we are, just to give it that gloss of science fiction and possibility and fantasy. But, of course, it has to be close to where we are for, because we need to understand the codes, the social codes within it, both on the one-to-one -one basis but also in the society contextually. You know, our, you know if a dragon turns up, the military are going to go in because that's the way that people respond to these things. I'm always interested in codes... But there are other kind of codes available at the Fringe this year, and you went to see a show that really just suggests Morse code, I think. So tell us about Dots and Dashes. That was a very high-concept segue, but I'll roll with it. <laughs> it's very kind of you to use a high-concept when the words terrible would have equally <laughs> sufficed. Dots and Dashes, a Bletchley Park musical, was a show I liked very much. It was a little bit out of what we think of the central area of the Fringe. It requires a journey. but Just like the characters. <laughs> <laughs> so well done. You're, you're on top of the metaphors today. Uh, it was a journey that I thought was absolutely justified. I really enjoyed this show. Partially because I am predisposed towards the subject matter, which is the real-life story of the intelligence efforts centered at a place called Bletchley Park, where Axis... Was Axis a term in World War II, or is that World War I? Uh, the, the Axis was the, um, the fascist side. Right. Well, well, we'll say the enemy for a shorthand. Yeah. In World War II, uh, their communications were intercepted by British intelligence and then expertly decoded because they were literally encoded through uh, the cryptographic tools of the time. Uh, Britain was able to do this in part through interception of codes and eventually the, uh, the Enigma device, which I think was sort of the, the master hardware encoder. Mm. And once... I forget if they, they captured uh, the device and were I believe, able to... I believe the credit should go to the Poles, actually. I believe the Polish captured the device, and it was that device that then gets its way to Bletchley Park right. to, to, be, to, to be used. So Bletchley Park was, uh, for the purpose of this story, uh, this, this historically-based story, was the intelligence centre, and um, the messages were decoded, and vital aspects of the war depended on the this information uh, there were there were interesting cases where the uh, where Churchill had to decide whether or not to act on the intelligence he had gotten because on one hand by preparing uh, a city for an aerial assault you could save lives but then you would give away you to knew what was happening. the invaders yeah. that they aha they, the English cracked the code we'd better change it again so there were all these really interesting decisions that had to be made uh, strategically and often um, with heartbreaking results. Anyway, this is all context. The story takes place at Bletchley Park and focuses on an all-female group of co-breakers and uh, translators. Uh, the nature of World War II is that many able-bodied men, in the literal sense, were sent to war, mm. leading women to take on some of the roles that, at the time, were traditionally male-based. So the, the story gives us a glimpse of this fascinating part of World War II, uh, it shows us what the efforts were like. It gives us kind of a, I don't want to say documentarian point of view, but it definitely gives us exposition about this effort in British intelligence 
and it shows us some of the conflicts between the requirements of the work and the personal lives of the women who were involved, uh, not the least of which was the fact that they were sworn to secrecy. Yes. So they had to make up fake job descriptions and often tell their loved ones, you know, they were going to work in a factory or they were a secretary. And another aspect of this is the, the literal thankless nature of the work. Because Bletchley Park, this was a shock to me, was actually kind of a, a secret up until the 70s. Yes. I had no idea about that. So if you think of, of, of these women who were working against the tide in terms of what was considered socially acceptable work, who were doing vital, vital intelligence work, and institutionally were sworn to secrecy, and were also facing a time where women were just not allowed to or, or encouraged to participate in this kind of work. So it was in every sense thankless, and it makes for a, uh, a great backdrop for a dramatic story where you have the ongoing drama of the war uh, leading up to, I believe, the D-Day invasion in the case of the story, but also the, the struggles uh, that the women face personally in, in, in dealing with secrecy and dealing with wanting to have personal lives or family lives. Uh, in one case, there's uh, implied but not outright stated uh, same-sex love interest, and that, of course, was extremely verboten. Yes. Uh, you know, the tragic story of Alan Turing sheds light on that and the consequences, and that's, of course, related to... Yeah, he's another breaking. Bletchley Park operative, isn't he? Yes. Exactly. So it was a, it was a very interesting uh, look at the period and a spinning out of a, a kind of a, a group narrative uh, of the, uh, the women working there. The music was often stylized um, to match or reflect... 1940s pop, you know, the boogie woogie bugle oh, boy it? style. Right. Uh, the, the Would you say the American end of the market? You know, I'm not a smart enough person to make that distinction. Oh, you are, but absolutely, but you may not know, you may not be fully knowledgeable about um, British alternative pop of the, the of the 30s and 40s. I will, I will accept that. I, I wouldn't say the whole thing sounded like it was all period music, but it was informed by period yeah. music, sometimes more overtly than others. The cast did an excellent job of conveying shades of personality. You have the very seemingly uptight code breaker who is glued to her headphones and she's listening to these uh, transmissions and she has to record them. Uh, you, uh, you have the, the people who, I'm sorry, I think I'm, I'm combining roles. There's a person who's monitoring transmissions. There, uh, there's a couple who are doing the code breaking. And then there's one who's sort of the big picture analyst who's, who's integrating this information and keeping a, an updated map of where they think the enemy's troops are and the, uh, the collaboration between them and how this lends itself to different personality types. Ah, oh, yes, because it's an ensemble piece by the sound of it. It is, yes, very much yeah. so. And now, there's always an interesting structural issue with uh, ensemble pieces, isn't there? Because actually, if it's an ensemble, you need to give everyone enough to do. Uh, and usually, although it sounds you've suggested that actually that they they're they're able to have their cake and eat it here, you don't often have a, a you know a, a couple forming or anything like that because that would take the focus away from the ensemble. Uh, so it's less often a sort of romantic story in these things, although there can easily be. Um, but actually, it sounds to me that you're, you're quite right. There's the, the individual characteristics and their interplay and their collaboration in an environment where collaboration is the key to success, but also the lives off being the extra dynamic force, as well as the context of the war and the possibility of immediate death. You know, I mean, Fletchley had been hit. I mean, that's one of the reasons it was so very, very secret. I think, I think that's the case. And you could draw an analogy, perhaps, to come from away even though the subject yeah. matters are very different, but there is a focus on different participants in a broad event, and the broad event in many ways provides the emotional impetus for the story. We do pay the price of an ensemble piece, which is always that our allotment of sympathy is being divvied up yeah. among many people, and, and sometimes some characters step more into the spotlight than others, but by and large, we are, we are, we are allotting our empathy across a group, which is perhaps a less focused experience than when you have a central uh, alphabet-like narrator who you're, whose emotional journey you're following one-to-one. -one. But I, I think the subject matter matter, <clears throat> but I think the subject matter is so worthy and interesting and the characterizations were so likable. You really felt connected to these characters that I, I felt it was worth drawing out this show and giving it some credit, both for the approach to the topic and the success they did in dramatizing it. So th thank you, Mike, for talking about Dots and Dashes. And actually, I, I, you know, it sounds like one of those shows which I really regret not having a chance to see, because, uh, fun enough, I like you. Like you, I have a, a shared interest in that era. And I can see absolutely how that sort of lends itself to a really dynamic, active, 
collaborative interplay, both in terms of the narrative, but also in terms of the story and how it's been put together. So that's Dots and Dashes. And it sounds like a really interesting show and about a really interesting period. And of course, the thing about the Second World War in particular is that actually it's almost always used as a kind of context for a musical rather than being, you know, there's, there's no definitive Second World War musical that I can think of where there is sort of... Well, there is for the First World War. Oh, what a lovely war. It sort of takes that entire conflict and um, satirically rips it to pieces in many senses, or at least show, shows a hard light to the reality of it. You know, where I just don't think the Second World War has that. And I've seen lots of musicals which have done various things, either on the active front or at the home front. Um, and this is quite interesting, but it does it from, if you like, the military position, but the military position which overlaps into the domestic front. And, of course, the great thing about... And, of course, the significant thing about the Second World War, more so than previous wars, certainly in the British context, is the way that there was warfare in the domestic environment with bombing and, um, you know, and the, I mean, there's always been the lads are oversea, if you like, but uh, it's... But I do just briefly want to touch on one more Second World War musical at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, and I'm only going to talk about it briefly because it didn't quite do what I thought it was going to do. But it was called, and it has the magnificent title, Handbook of Civilian Defence, brackets what every loyal American can do to help the United States win the war, close brackets. Now, I went to see this because it promised and it delivered that uh, it was going to take a little handbook, which I believe was delivered and given to uh, American citizens uh, uh, at the point that the Americans joined the war in 1941, uh, because there was a genuine possibility and fear of air raids reaching American soil. Now, very little happened. Well, I believe there was some skirmishing around some of the coasts. But obviously, it's a long way for a, a German bomber to go. And there were other places that were so much easier to reach. Uh, I'm a Londoner, you know. So, but that doesn't in any way diminish the fact that defences and concerns were in place. And this handbook, I believe, was handed out to, uh, to citizens in America. And this theatrical company, which I think is American, has created what I would call a verbatim theatre musical piece about it. What I'd hoped for is that someone had set the entire book to music. To music and yeah. that's what I was really looking forward to, because I like verbatim theatre, I like verbatim musical theatre, which is even rarer, and that use of reusing and reiterating phrases to get musical senses and harmonies and layers, which actually... Uh, really bring the point of the musical out and the interesting thing to me was that actually they took a slightly different path they acted the entire text and I do mean the entire text they even included the copyright notice from, uh, when it was printed and the printing company who were credited on one of the earlier pages uh, I think the only thing they didn't actually read out was the page numbering because that would have obviously destroyed the narrative flow but the text, all the text in that book was acted and performed uh, and it was very interesting. Also, you know, it shows a very particular approach to a multiracial society, which America certainly was in the 1940s. You know, you would have had lots of people of German descent, of Japanese descent, you know, people whose families were on the other side of the war, if you like. Uh, and it does tackle things. So the book itself is interesting as a snapshot of history and an attempt to be cautious whilst at the same time liberal in terms of its the people of America. But what they did, the way it made, they made it a musical, was to stick songs in which then underlined some of the chapters and points which had been made. So there were extra songs stuck in. So the songs themselves were not taken from the book. Right. They were illustrative. Uh, I enjoyed the piece very much, but it didn't quite do what I'd hoped it was going to do. And I still think there might be an absolutely fabulous musical to be had from that handbook or other similar handbooks. Um, in this country, a lot of those handbooks handed out, both to British soldiers but also to American soldiers who were stationed in Britain in the Second World War, uh, are fabulously interesting uh, and unintentionally very often funny. Um, I've seen a few excerpts yeah. and how each uh, nation characterizes the culture of the other, um, whether from a visiting or hosting standpoint. Well, my favorite one from the advice to American airmen uh, based in Britain was something along the lines of, you, you will be considered to be and will actually be richer than the local people that you meet in Britain. You should not flash your cash, essentially. <laughs> so. Which is good advice no matter what. Oh, it is, absolutely. But um, I love the fact it's in an official government handbook. That's the thing that I think amuses me the most. Um, so there we are. That's one extra musical about the Second World War. And we still, I think, travel in search of the perfect Second World War musical. But there's so many ways that you can tackle that conflict 
and either make it the central point or a context in your musical or one's musical. But I think we'll be talking about it again in the future. I would imagine. But for the moment then, Mike, thank you very much indeed for talking about these shows this time. And I know this won't be the last time we do for the Edinburgh Festival Fringe 2022. Looking forward to next time. Musical Talk. Well, there we are. That was Mike and me in conversation talking about the Handbook of Civilian Defence, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to give you the full title again. Dots and Dashes, Lizard Boy, surely a cult musical just waiting to be recognised as such if it already hasn't been. And Medea the Musical, which was a wonderful musical, a magnificent musical and a show that we were very much impressed by and which addresses some really quite serious things in a way which is actually very palatable because it could be so... Well, depressing. And interestingly, of course, it's an old classic story which has been given a modern polish and turned into a fabulous musical, which I think brings us all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, full circle, if you like, because I started this episode with a very poor joke about My Fair Lady, which, of course, is based on the story of Pygmalion and Galatea, which, as you may know, is a classical Greek text about a sculptor called Pygmalion who falls in love with one of his own statues, Galatea, who then comes to life. Complications ensue, as you can imagine. But what's quite interesting, by the way, and I'll finish the episode on this tiny little tidbit, which is unrelated to anything else, but I think quite interesting, is that My Fair Lady was not the first musicalisation of the story of Pygmalion. For that, we have to go back to the end of the 19th century and unsurprisingly the name W.S. Gilbert looms large, but not in the sense of being the librettist or the lyricist for this musical version of Pygmalion. Interestingly, and as you probably know, W.S. Gilbert didn't just write librettos with Sullivan, he did write librettos and lyrics for other musical shows of that period, other comic operas. But he was also a straight playwright and had huge successes at the time. One of his great successes from 1871 was a play called Pygmalion and Galatea. And in some senses, it is the show which inspired George Bernard Shaw to write his version of Pygmalion, which became My Fair Lady. But it didn't just inspire George Bernard Shaw. It inspired some people called Henry Pottinger Stevens and W. Webster, and I'm sure you won't have heard of them, and a composer called Wilhelm Meyer Lutz to write a parody, or what was called at the time a burlesque, of Gilbert's own version of Pygmalion. And that was called, and this is quite witty, Galatea or Pygmalion Reversed. So he didn't just reverse the roles of Pygmalion and Galatea by giving Galatea top billing. He added a dash to make it reversed, meaning a new set of lyrics about this piece. So we have an unusual situation of W.S. Gilbert's own straight version of Pygmalion and Galatea being burlesqued in 1883 by Lutz, Webster and Stevens. And the thing that's interesting, and the only real reason I'm mentioning it, is because it was a musical. So it accidentally becomes the first musicalisation of the story of Pygmalion, or as we know it today, My Fair Lady. And whilst there's not that much information about Galatea or Pygmalion reversed, the burlesque, we do know the name of three of the songs, which include The Masha King, Masha being a fashionable swell from the Regency period or the beginning of the 19th century, so that rather suggests fashion here. And so do the other songs. There's another song called The Modern Swell, so one presumes, of course, that there's a comparison being made between the modern fashionable young man and the historic fashionable young man in those two songs. And finally, the bashful maiden, which is presumably Galatea herself. Well, there we are. I bet you weren't expecting that ending when you leaped into this episode today. However, every corner of musical theatre is interesting to me, and I hope it is to you. And if it is, then why not tune in again to future episodes of Musical Talk? We're out again next week on Tuesday, and then again on every Tuesday forever and ever thereafter, I imagine. We're not so very far away from our 800th episode, which is something to marvel at or despair at. The choice, ladies and gentlemen, is yours. And whilst you're pondering the answer and giving your own verdict, let's give you some time to think. And I'm going to do that by ending this episode, which is best achieved by me stopping talking. And the best way of doing that in a polite fashion is to use that word which we know brings me to a shuddering end. And that is, and here it is, ladies and gentlemen, in practice, goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.
this episode of Musical Talk, presented by Thos Ribbits and Mike Shapiro, and edited by Thos Ribbits. Although I would like to extend my thanks to Mike for some of his technical assistance in cleaning up these recordings. Copyright Musical Talk 2022. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our website, www.musicaltalk.co.uk or subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at MusicalTalkThos. What Haley did with this show is take a story that itself was, of course, uh, <laughs> the Murphy's Law says the yes. vacuum cleaner has to start when we talk, um, 